Good morning. Welcome back to, we probably are down to only like 16, 8 a.m. lectures left this, this year, but who's counting? Um, so we're gonna finish up talking about aromatic substitution today. Um, and in general, so I have not finished grading your quizzes, but I did go through all of the quizzes and um, read the questions that that were asked. Um, there were a couple that are relevant and a couple just, just for fun. So we'll talk about those. Um, and then we'll talk about, we'll add two other aromatic substitution mechanisms. And then just like back when we first learned SN1 versus SN2 versus E1 versus E2, we had to have a set of criteria for choosing which mechanism was going to be the most dominant and most likely mechanism um, in order to figure out what the products were going to be, right? And so now if we're going to have um, three different aromatic substitutions, we're going to have to have some, some sort of similar criteria. Um, the good news is that since it's not all nucleophilic, some of them are nucleophilic, um, we actually have some pretty cut and dry criteria where, that allows us to say 100% this set of criteria goes through er electrophilic aromatic substitution. This set of criteria goes through elimination addition. Um, and so we'll go through those and, and practice with those as well. Um, so start with, while everybody else is still getting logged on, we'll start with some of the, the, um, the fun questions that were asked. Um, so I, the, why do certain kinds of food coloring stain your mouth and skin so well? Um, that generally has to do with solubility. Any, any dyes or stains that are soluble in your skin cells that are soluble in fats are going to be a lot harder to remove, especially if you're washing your hands with water, because they're going to tend to dissolve in the cell membranes, even of your, your dead skin cells on the surface of your skin, um, are still going to have a lot of those cell membrane um, hydrophil or hydrophobic regions. And so anything that's nonpolar is going to dissolve at least partially well in those, but way better than in water. So if you're washing your hands with water, you're not going to be able to remove those very well. Um, you can get around that by washing your hands with things that are not water. Um, if you can use, you know, you use acetone. Acetone's not good for your skin to come into contact with, but it will remove most stains and dyes from your skin pretty well. Um, strong soaps will do the same thing. Um, well, you where you can increase the solubility of the dye in the water, um, although it still might take a little bit because if it's gone past the surface layer of your skin. Uh, or if it's really nonpolar, it's still going to fight getting dissolved in the water. So you might just be stuck with a stain for a while, um, which is this is also the same reason that that Sharpies, you know, permanent markers are really hard to scrub off of almost anything porous. But if you put acetone on them, you can take it off right away. Nonpolar solvents um, are going to allow you to dissolve just about anything you want. It's just sometimes you have to be careful because. Um, Nonpolar solvents are typically not very good um, for your skin or you know wood or any sort of um, living living thing. Um, I think Elki asked about one of these questions uh, to Adam. Um, Let's see, how does the aromatic ring in tetrahydrocannabin all react with heat? Um, what you're thinking of is probably not um, the tetrahydrocannabinol or THC reacting with heat. It's actually tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. Um, and so if we look at the two structures, so THC is the active is the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. Um, 
and it's got a fairly low vaporization point, it's a fairly stable molecule. Um, but the way it's present in um, in the cannabis flower is actually in this form that is not actually psychoactive. THCA has this acid group attached to one of the benzene rings. And that acid group renders it basically ineffective in the human brain. It doesn't really do much. Um, and so when you're heating, it, you need to heat the THCA to turn it into THC. What you're doing is essentially removing that acid group. Um, you can see that that acid group, you know, an acid group CO2H, right? And then attached to an R group. You're one carbon carbon bond away from being a fully oxidized carbon. If you heat it in the presence of oxygen, what happens is that CO2 group pops off as a CO2 molecule. And you wind up replacing it with just a hydrogen. So you can convert THCA into THC um, just by adding heat. And so that's what's known as decarboxylation. And that's why if you, if you just ate weed, it has almost no effect on the human body. But if you heat it first and then eat it, that's what, um, then, it can, then it can act with the human brain. Um, so that's, that's why you bake a lot to make edibles rather than you, most edibles have some form of raising the temperature above about 250 Fahrenheit for an extended period of time. Um, and sometimes you're referred to as activating, but it's really what you're doing is you're decarboxylating, you're removing that CO2 group. Um, and as you can see, the benzene ring portion has, is uh, not different at all. All we're doing is as we increase the temperature, we're gonna favor the side that has more free molecules, right? More entropy is favored at higher temperatures. And so removing that CO2 group to make two separate molecules at high temperatures is, the, is favored at equilibrium. Um, we'll save these others since it was Emily and Adam that asked these and they're not here yet. So we'll answer those on Thursday if they're here. And somebody asked, is the mechanism of chlorination and bromination the same? Yep. The only thing that's different is we have a different Lewis acid. Um, with chlorination, with electrophilic aromatic chlorination, we were using uh, aluminum trichloride as our Lewis acid. And with bromination, we either used iron as the metal or we used iron tribromide or iron three bromide as our. Lewis acid. But beyond that, beyond the identity of the Lewis acid, it's the exact same um, mechanism. Your halogen, your diatomic halogen bonds to the Lewis acid to turn one of your halogens into a strong electrophile. And your strong electrophile can attack the benzene ring and temporarily break the aromaticity to make that sigma complex. Um, this question is more of a, of a logistical question when it comes to studying for the, the test in the midterm. Um, so it would not be a bad idea to have sort of a master list of mechanisms, um, or at least sort of a, a reference sheet that you ha can have in front of you um, that has, say, maybe the page numbers. Of, of the various re reaction reviews or the different reactions, or just make yourself a list of hand-drawn mechanisms to practice studying. Um, if you keep a, a list of what the most important mechanisms are that we've gone through, then you should be set up on the test to be able to find them um, quickly. Um, so I, I thought that was a good, a good question. I typically, since I have a digital copy that I use more than anything else, um, I just use the bookmarks that are built into that to find the reaction reviews um, and skim through. But um, on a time situation, you might want to go faster. So it might not be a bad idea to make yourself your own um, table of contents of the most important pages. 
Um, and then uh, Stephanie brought up that uh, in calculus, you're learning about X, Y, Z planes and three-dimensional coordinates. Um, I, how much of OCHEM relates to calculus besides building the molecules in 3D? It depends on how in-depth you want to go, but all of, um, all of the quantum mechanical stuff is all based around calculus. It's just calculus and um, linear algebra at the same time. It's matrices of calculus functions that you mix together to make those molecular orbitals. Those molecular orbitals, the shape of those molecular orbitals is determined, a lot of that is determined by um, calculus. Rates is all calculus. So calculus actually shows up a lot in chemistry, but because calculus is not a prereq to gen chem, we kind of skip over a lot of the calculus part of it because not everybody's at the same level in math. Um, so as you, if you go higher in chemistry, you'll actually see a lot of calculus showing up. Um, physical chemistry has a huge chunk of it is, um, is partial derivatives, where you're taking the, the derivative of the pressure with respect to changing temperature, for instance. A lot of gas laws, um, you wind up deriving um, gas laws in certain systems based on certain assumptions. Um, and that's all going to be calculus based. Uh, so there's there's a lot of it. And it, it just determines how in depth you want to go. Just like um, if you look at um, you know econ, for instance, there's a huge portion of economics that is based around calculus. Um, that's actually what the derivatives market, if you ever heard of the derivatives market, um, is literally the derivative of a company's past performance in the stock market. So, and then you can get further into that where you've got derivatives of derivatives, which in it, they literally are looking at the slope of the function that's, um, that is represented by a company's previous performance in the stock market. So calculus actually shows up in a lot of different fields. Any field that has any numbers in it whatsoever, is going to have calculus in it to some extent, um, especially if you're trying to predict where things are going based on past trends. All right, so let's do a little bit of review. So with one of the electrophilic aromatic substitutions that we have not spent as much time with, um, which was the friedel crafts acylation, so we've got acetyl chloride and aluminum chloride. And remember, um, acetyl chloride is, I don't know why that's written. Actually, I do know why that's written twice, um, but we don't need that written twice. Remember, acetyl chloride is this molecule here. So you've got a, an acid chloride, and it's the acid chloride is um, acetic acid where you've replaced the OH with a chloride. All right, so that's gonna be our electrophile. We'll give that a try, and we'll go through these in a second. All right, so the key with this, they're all gonna, we're all gonna be adding the same electrophile each time and the existing substituents are gonna determine where we add this electrophile. Um, so if we have a nitro group, that's electron withdrawing with pi bonds, right? And those conjugated pi bonds means it's a meta director. 
So we're going to add an acetyl group in the meta position. Oops, I did not mean to clear all of those. So in either meta position works. All right, so if we have pi bonds, or if we have pi bonds conjugated with the benzene ring, it's going to be a meta director. If we have lone pairs conjugated with the with the benzene ring, it's going to be an ortho para director. So we'll actually get two products for for um, B here. We'll get the ortho product, and we will get the para product. Wait, I'm sorry. For the first one, we only get one product? Correct. OK. Because the two meta positions are identical to each other, right? So it doesn't matter which meta position you put the acetyl chloride in, you'll get the same product. What about what about directly across from it? You can't so that would be a that would be para position, right? And so the nitro group cannot have anything added in directly across from it. Okay. Because so any remember anything with a with pi bonds conjugated with the benzene ring, so nitro groups sulfate groups, um, acetyl groups, any pi bonds conjugated with the benzene ring are only going to allow your new substituent to be put in the meta position, right? So you will only see them in that one spot removed. Um, however, anything with lone pairs conjugated, you can put it in either the ortho position or you can put it in the para position. So you'll get two products for B, but only one product for A. C starts getting more complicated because we have a meta director and an ortho para director both on there at the same time. So we want to satisfy both of them at the same time, if possible, um, which we can in this case, right? We have we have um, the anything that's going to be ortho or para to the alcohol is going to be meta to the nitro group. So we'll get two products once again for C. Wind up with nitro alcohol. We'll either wind up adding our acetyl group in the position that's para to the alcohol or ortho to the alcohol. And remember, I don't, we don't have any that are actually in conflict with each other it, in this case, because D, we have two substituents as well, but they're, we can make both of them satisfied at the same time. But anytime we have two substituents where that are trying to direct the new substituent in conflicting positions, you go with the strongest activator. The strongest activator is going to be what controls um, where you can put your new substituent. But there's a pretty good chance that you're going to, if you have two substituents on there already, that they're going to wind up both directing towards the same, same carbons. 
based on the resonance. For instance, D, you have two ortho para directors and they're positioned such that you can make both of them satisfied at the same time. We're gonna add our acetyl group here or here or here. So I'll actually get three products for D. Right, and the reason it's three products instead of two in this case is because the two ortho or the two yeah ortho positions are not are distinct from each other based on the stereochemistry. Right, we can tell the difference between if we talk about relative to the to the uh, alcohol. Alcohol has three distinct positions that are either ortho or para. Those are the three carbons that we could put our acetyl group on and we can tell the difference. We'll get three different isomers based on where we put that. The red and the blue are both ortho to the alcohol, but they're distinct from each other because the red is ortho to both the alcohol and the methoxy. And the blue is ortho to the alcohol, but, but para to the methoxy. Right, so you could go through and draw all three of those products. And I guess since we have space here, might as well. So if we add our acetyl group to the red carbon, you get this. If we add our acetyl, to the blue carbon, and if you add it to the pink carbon, We get this. All right, so those are all the ortho and para positions to the existing substituents, but it gives us three distinct molecules. And some of these probably have, this actually might be a molecule that has a common name, or at least you, or you would modify it. Um, methoxyphenol might have a, a common name, um, which in which case we would name um, acetyl, acetyl uh, methoxyphenol would be probably the IUPAC name we would be looking at here. Um, so for, for instance, for the red one, the name of this molecule. The base molecule would be phenol. And then um, you could have, if it's phenol, then carbon one is where the alcohol is attached. So you could have two acetyl three methoxy. Phenol. Although, like I said, this we're getting into a region where these molecules wind up being, um, that's probably something that could be created in nature and um, depending on the organism, um, because we're not all that far from the structure of salicylic acid. If you replace that methoxy group with it with an acid group, then you get a salicylic acid. And adding an uh, acetyl group to salicylic acid gives you uh, acetyl salicylic acid, or which is better known as aspirin. 
Um, so we're not that far from some pharmaceuticals with some of these structures. The ones with the bromines and the nitro groups are going to be a little bit less common. Nitro groups don't show up all that often in nature. Um, adding an acetyl group to bromobenzene, I have no idea what that's going to do. Sometimes you see some halogens in pharmaceuticals, but typically not bromine. Um, because it's such a big molecule. Chlorine gets sh shows up a lot in pharmaceuticals because it's got similar size to an alcohol group and similar electronegativity to an alcohol group. So you see that a lot in pharmaceuticals um, where you've just where you just take an OH group and you replace it with a chloride with a chloride. Um, bromine's a little bit less common, at least in in well understood and FDA approved pharmaceuticals. You see it a lot in uh, in some of those. Um, designer drugs um, that are not something that anybody should be putting into their body without a lot of further research done by the FDA. Um, but they do have some, some amount of, of uh, biochemical effect in the body. So I guess I can't say that no bromines show up in pharmaceuticals, just not in approved pharmaceuticals. All right. Let's clear this. Just a recap. Remember some of our other electrophilic substitutions. Um, what do we what do we add as our electrophile when we have fuming sulfuric acid and benzene? What do we wind up adding? Sulfate group. Yeah, and it's it's um so it's an SO3 group with the sulfur directly attached. If it wasn't, and I, I may have used the term incorrectly earlier, so I might have thrown you off. Um, a sulfate group would be an SO4 where one of the oxygens was attached to the benzene. So we actually get what's it's called a sulfonate. So very slightly different. So yeah, it's an SO3H. So we would wind up, and we'll actually, we actually see that sometimes um, where you can link molecules together um, with this structure, where instead of having an H on that last uh, oxygen, you actually have it linked to another R group, and that's called a sulfonate ester. Um, So we and that the reaction is called sulfonic sulfonication. I, got, I can't I lose a syllable in there every time I try to pronounce it without reading it. So I'll double check the way to um, spell that reaction. But we're adding an SO3H to the benzene ring. Sulfonication. I see. I still think it's missing a syllable. I can't do it. I need to look it up. All right, and then if we have Br2 and a Lewis acid, in this case, just iron, but it could also be FeBr3. Um, we're going to add a bromine. We're going to pull a hydrogen off and replace it with a bromine. Right when we when we don't already have something on there, when we don't need to worry about meta directors versus ortho para directors, it's pretty easy, right? We only had like five. One, two, three, four, five, six, six reactions to deal with, right? Bromination, chlorination, adding a sulfonate group, adding a nitro group, um, add, and then the um, acylation, which is adding an acetyl group, adding a ketone, or alkylation, which was adding an, an R group. So let's do some more practice with this. Now we're getting into some tricky ones. So I'll give you guys a few seconds. Remember, you're looking at ortho para directors, which are activators. Having lone pairs conjugated with the benzene ring is an activator. 
pi bonds conjugated are meta directors. And if they're in conflict with each other, the strongest activator controls where you put your new substituent. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to work through these. So for this first one, we have three substituents before the reaction even happens. But in a happy coincidence, they're all cooperating to put our new substituent in the same place. Right? The two esters are going to be ortho para or are going to be meta directors. There's only one carbon that's meta to both of them. And our bromine is an ortho para director which is going to put a chlorine in the opposite side. Realistically, this reaction is not going to happen very well because we have three, we have two strong deactivators and, and a weak deactivator all on the same benzene. So this is not a reaction we would expect to happen very quickly because we have, even our ortho para director is a deactivator. Remember halogens were in that gray area of their deactivators despite having lone pairs. Um, so this is a reaction that they're realistically having three deactivators on the same benzene. You could have answered this with a quick no reaction. Because even with the aluminum chloride, there's um, our electrophile is not going to be strong enough that we could that we could easily chlorinate. You'll probably get some product. If you get, let it go long enough, you would get this product. Um, but it might be a reaction that would take a week at, at you know, even when, when adding heat to it. Um, and if you went into organic synthesis or grad school um, or in industry, you might actually have some reactions that are worth doing that make a product that's valuable enough. Um, that it's worth having a reaction go for a whole week where you have to sit and babysit it for an entire week and watch the temperature. Um, those are less than ideal though, um, especially considering your yields are still probably gonna be low. And at the end of it, you could lose all of your product just if you mess up your purification. Um, so it's definitely not an ideal reaction. Usually if we we're trying to make this molecule, we'd look for, um, any other way we could make this molecule rather than doing this reaction. Our second reaction here, we have two methyl groups, which are both ortho para directors, but they're weakly activating. And then we have our methoxy group, which is more strongly activating. And if you're unsure whether something is weakly activating or strongly activating, remember you've got that um, that cheat sheet um, that I'm pulling up right now. Let's see, where did it go? 
Hang on one second. All right, so here's the chart. So it's on it's on uh, page 814 of the textbook or 834 if you have the PDF. Um, and anything with an oxygen um, that is anything with a lone pair that is conjugated with the pi ring is more strongly activating than an alkyl group. So when we're picking which of these compounds is going to be sort of in control of the situation, it's that methoxy group that's going to control. So they're, everything that's on there is an ortho para director. But the fact that one of them is stronger than the rest means that we want ortho and para to the methoxy group. So we'll get two products. We'll get a nitro group added right there and a nitro group added in the para position to the methoxy group. And in this case, since everything that's on there, the the other substituents that are also um, activators means you'll get some of the other products too. There's what one other possible product, right? Which would be putting the, um, which would be putting the nitro group right here. You'd get some of that because everything that's on there is an activator. And so you'll make some of that just not as fast as these other two products. H2SO4, fuming H2SO4, we're gonna add a sulfonate group and we're going to put it, we have ortho para directors that are opposite from each other. So we're going to wind up with another conflict here. And they're both roughly the same amount of, of electron donating, right? So we're going to go with the one that's smaller. And we're going to put them ortho to the smaller substituent just based on the sterics. So we'd wind up with. So we would wind up with this as our major product. And last case here, we've got a strongly activating alcohol group. So that's going to be in control of the whole thing. And that's going to put our new nitro group is going to go ortho to the existing alcohol group or meta to the existing nitro group. All right, so first quarter, we spent a lot of time on nomenclature and how to do SN1, SN2, E1, E2. Second quarter, we spent a lot of time on alcohol reactions, right? This quarter, electrophilic and benzene substitutions, aromatic substitutions is the probably the single most important class of reactions that we're going over. That's why we're spending so much time on this. Because if we add this to the other reactions we have for synthesis, 
we can make just about anything we want. We can control where we're putting things on benzene ring. And now that opens up a whole nother realm of possibilities for um, how we can synthesize molecules. And since most pharmaceuticals have a benzene ring in them somewhere, this winds up being a really, really important piece of synthesis, especially for the biotech industry. All right, so before break, let's cover one of the new mechanisms we're gonna add today. Um, occasionally, if we're trying to replace a leaving group other than hydrogen, um, usually what we're going to see is nucleophilic aromatic substitution. So this we've done sub nucleophilic substitution before. It was first order, or second order, right? SN1, SN2. Nucleo nucleophilic aromatic substitution is kind of similar to any of the other nucleophilic substitutions we have, um, except that we need to have certain criteria met in order to make the process stable enough. Uh, and so and what we can see is if you have a bromine, for instance, halides are the most common to, that we see this with, just like with SN1 and SN2, halides were the best leaving groups, right? Um, we can actually replace that with another nucleophile um, and get decent yields with it is as long as these three criteria are, are met. And the first criteria is you need to have another really strong electron withdrawing group. So a sulfonate works, but nitro groups are the more are more common. So you need a powerful electron withdrawing group. And we want to see other things that are in the same category of electron withdrawing. We're down here and it has to be one of these three cases. Something that's going to pull electron density very strongly away from the benzene ring. And then the next criteria, criterion um, is that you're, you have to have a good leaving group. This reaction doesn't work with an with a okay leaving group. It has to be a good leaving group, which usually means it's a halide. Um, so bromide, chloride, iodide. And your leaving group must be ortho or para to the electron withdrawing group. If you don't meet all three of these criteria, this reaction doesn't happen. Which kind of limits it a lot, right? It gives you very, very clear cut situations where you can expect this reaction to happen. This is a, a far cry from when we were studying SN1 and SN2 and there was all that gray area. Well, well, they're all happening at the same time, but we're picking which one's favored, right? This is very, very clear cut. If you don't have all three of these things, it doesn't happen, period. Um, and the, the mechanism looks a lot like electrophilic substitution, which is convenient. So it's not all that different. The difference is, is that we have a nucleophile attacking, but it's still going to be attacking the chlorine or sorry, the carbon that's part of the benzene ring. It's just the part of the benzene ring that has the good leaving group attached to it. And then you wind up making something very similar to the sigma complex, except that this one's named after a scientist named Meisenheimer. So you make the Meisenheimer complex instead of a sigma complex, but it looks very similar to what we've already seen with electrophilic substitution, right? And then the reason why we need that powerful nitro group on there, that electron withdrawing group, is going to be, it's going to allow us to stabilize. If we have a nucleophile attacking, we're adding extra electrons. If it's an electrophile that's attacking, we're pulling electrons away from it. So 
adding extra electrons means having a nitro group allows us more room to spread that negative charge out and gives us all of these resonant structures that allow us to stabilize the Meisenheimer complex. Um, but at the end, we wind up with the same basic process, loss of a leaving group. In this case, our leaving group's just, it's not just a hydrogen, it's a leaving, it's a halogen that's going to bring the extra pair of electrons with it. So that's what this last step is showing. You can see that the chlorine is pulling electrons with it as, it, as it's leaving. With the electrophilic substitution, we kicked a hydrogen off and it didn't get to bring the electrons with it, right? And that's what allowed us to reform the benzene ring. In this case, we've got too many electrons. So the chlorine being electrophilic brings the, or being, being electronegative brings the extra pair of electrons with it. All right, so let's take a break there. And then when we come back, when you come back, I want you to take a couple minutes to answer these few questions and give it a, a shot at, um, at getting the right product. Assuming since we just went over the last, the last uh, reaction that that reaction is relevant to both of these. So let's say come back at nine o'clock and have, have worked on at least the first one of these and then we'll work through them as a group.
All right, so let's start coming back with the solution to the first problem up on the slide here. And then while you guys are thinking about the second problem, I'm going to pull up some relevant, a relevant page from the textbook. And I got the order of the reactions wrong. So we actually haven't gone over the last reaction, which is a way to convert a nitro group to an amine. Um, we actually have a reaction that will do that. So, so let's, but we haven't covered it yet. So let's just treat it. We're trying to make para nitrophenol. Well, if we were starting from benzene, How would we do that? Probably start with brominating it, bromine and iron. Yeah, so if we start with benzene, and react it with bromine and iron, we don't have a way to add an OH group. We don't have a, a way to, to add an alcohol as part of the electrophilic substitution, but we do have a way to replace a bromine with an OH group. So that's gonna be the approach here. And actually let me clear this and get get a white screen here. So we're trying to get to para nitro phenol. So if we start with benzene, bromine and iron will give us bromobenzene. Then what do we need to do? The nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Yep. Could we do, could we switch those first two steps? No, because then your bromine would be a uh, meta to the nitro group. Yeah, so Exactly. So if we're, if we're trying to add two substituents to a benzene ring, you have to pay attention to what order you do them in, because if one of them's an ortho para director and one of them's a meta director, changing the order will change their substitution relative to each other. Uh, and really, this isn't the only product you would get. We would get the ortho product as well. But if we don't care about the ortho product, we then it's essentially a byproduct that we're going to wind up trying to get rid of at the end when we purify this whole thing. So then now we're left with a nitro group para to bromine, and we want an oxygen and OH group para to bromine. So we need to go through that nucleophilic substitution. We meet all the criteria. We've got a nitro group para to a good leaving group. So if we expose this to NaOH, then we're going to wind up replacing the bromine with the hydroxide. And to get best yield, we wouldn't do it just NaOH. We would 
do NaOH and heat, and then we'd follow it up with um, some sort of acid proton source, H3O plus. Because hydroxide is a strong enough base that any excess hydroxide will actually leave our molecule deprotonated. So if we want the protonated form as our final product, we would need to um, give it a little bit of acid at the very end um, just to protonate that oxygen. And it's not very neatly drawn, but that was a delta for heat. And so starting just from benzene, there's a lot of different possibilities depending on what electrophilic substitutions you use and what order you do them in. We can put a lot of different substituents anywhere we want on the benzene ring. We're somewhat limited by the fact that um, we're going to get these two competing reactions at one point. We're going to get, um, and we're likely to get more of the ortho product because there's two ortho carbons. So this is not a perfect um, synthesis just because we're going to be limited to only about a third, 33% yield just by virtue of, of that um, second step there. Even if we got 100% yield everywhere else, we're still only going to get maybe based on sterics because bromine is so big, maybe 40% um, para, which is still less than ideal, right? That's still a pretty wasteful process. Uh, and so what we'll see a lot in pharmaceutical chemistry is that rather than start from raw benzene, which is has its own has its own drawbacks, part partially because benzene is a carcinogen on its own, um, a lot of times we'll start from natural products that are already substituted benzene. You start from um, almond extract is benzaldehyde is a really convenient place to start. Or you can start from phenol, which is pretty easy to come by. Um, and then, then it makes it a lot easier. You're limiting how many steps you need to take and increasing your yield. Or even better, if you have some, if you can get a natural product that's already dye substituted and you just need to substitute one step further um, or do a nucleophilic substitution because you already have a good leaving group where you want it. All right, so last new mechanism. Um, this is the third substitution mechanism that we've seen for benzenes. Um, and this is another substitution where you're going to replace a chlorine or a halide, a good leaving group with a nucleophile. So it's nucleophilic. Um, and what we see is really only happens when we get to um, very high temperatures. You have to get up near 350 Celsius to do this. Uh, and the trickiest thing about this is that it does not follow our ortho para versus meta rules. If we have a methyl group attached, in the ortho position, what we get when we go through this mechanism is we get a mixture of the, sorry, I said ortho, I meant para. Um, if we have a chlorine and a methyl in, that are para relative to each other, when we go through this reaction, we get a mixture of para and meta, not ortho and para. So this must be a very different mechanism because we're getting, we're getting very different isomers than what we would expect. 
a very different mixture of isomers. So this actually brings up a uh, an interesting technique that's used for figuring out mechanisms. And you actually see this a lot in biochemistry as well, when they're trying to figure out mechanism of certain biosynthesis pathways. Um, they use what's called isotopic labeling. Um, and isotopic labeling um, comes is a way of of labeling one specific carbon or one specific atom in a way that we can then tell it apart from other atoms um, of the same type. So we can tell carbon 14 apart from carbon 12. So most of these carbons are carbon 12, but we if we can specifically put carbon 14 in the spot that has chlorine attached to it and then put it through this reaction, the product that we get will tell us something about the mechanism. So a lot of times, um, one of the other big places this was done in biochemistry was, um, this is one of the ways they figured out the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, is you started from, um, you started the glycolysis pathway with glucose that had several of its carbons or all of its carbons labeled as carbon-14. And then you watch what happens when it goes through glycolysis and into the citric acid cycle, you watch what happens to those radioactive carbons. And then that allows you to tell, say, okay, oh, this is, this is being turned into acetyl-CoA and incorporated into the citric acid. And it kind of, it tells you a lot about the actual process um, by looking at the, where these radioactive isotopes go. So it's also very similar to the way that you diagnose um various illnesses by by having somebody eat something that has a radioactive isotope in it and then tracing it through the body we can actually do that at the atomic level as well um and so what they saw when they did this is if you started with all of your chlorine was attached to the radioactive carbon when you went through this reaction you got a product where 50 percent of your your new substituent was not on the same carbon it started with. It was adjacent to the carbon it started with. And so the reason that they, that they eventually figured out is because it goes through a very different intermediate called benzene. So it's like an alkyne, it's like benzene, except with a Y-N-E, right? Benzene tells us there's a triple bond. And so this is kind of similar to the nucleophilic substitution, except that we have the, the leaving group leaves first. So it's like the difference between SN1 and SN2. In the addi elimination addition, you wind up with the chlorine, your leaving group leaves, and it makes this intermediate where you've got actually a triple bond um, as part of the benzene ring, which is not super stable, but it's still aromatic because that the extra pair of electrons is not conjugated because both of those carbons already have a pair of electrons contributing to the to the resonance structure. So that triple bond is localized. It can't resonate. The, it'd be the second pi bond is localized and can't resonate, but it makes it really reactive, right? Because those two carbons then are trying to be SP, which would be linear or, linear or 180 degree bond angle, right? So it's unstable based on the geometry, but it's still aromatic. So it's stable enough that it can exist for a significant period of time. And the, the mechanism is kind of exactly what it sounds like, elimination addition. You wind up going through an elimination reaction where your leaving group leaves and you make a, a triple bond. And usually you need this, the elimination means you have something being pulled off from both sides of where your new pi bond is forming, right? 
So you need a, a strong base that can pull a hydrogen off and that gives you an extra pair of electrons and then that allows your halide to leave and you make a new pi bond, you make that benzyne intermediate. And then if you still have more nucleophile around, that nucleophile can come in and attach to either end of that triple bond. And you wind up with another proton transfer at the end. So you wind up with elimination and then addition, and hence the name. Um, and that's exactly why you wind up with both possible isomers in these cases is because both ends of the alkyne group are equal as far as their electron density. So you have an equal chance of, of this OH adding to either of these. Either of these carbons. So that's why we get the for this bottom reaction here, why we get the para and the meta is because it's going through that benzyne intermediate. And that benzyne intermediate has to be one end of the triple bond has to be where the chlorine was. So that would be our benzyne intermediate in this case. So the only two places that you could add your new nucleophile would be on either end of the triple bond. All right, so, and how do we know this actually happens? Because this is all sort of um, tricky to prove a mechanism. But one of the ways we, we can actually observe this happening is the fact that we can actually get benzyne to go through a diels alder reaction to act as a dienophile. Um, so if you have furan, you can get furan as a diene you can actually get benzyne to act as the dienophile and you wind up going through a cyclo addition and you make this weird tricyclic product at the end. That's only possible if you have a pi bond that can act as a dienophile. So this is one of the, one of the pieces of evidence that they use to say, hey, no, this is how this reaction actually happens, um, is by proving essentially that benzyne exists as the intermediate. All right, so let's do another pro or another practice. You've got four chloro, two methyl toluene, and it's treated with a strong base, sodium amide, followed by H3O plus. So you might want to start by drawing out your reaction, figuring out what your product or products will be.
So strong base, good leaving group. Um, tells us that we're probably going to go through this elimination addition. If you need, if you have a strong base, elimination is a possibility. If you have a strong base that's also a strong nucleophile, then after you make that elimination product, you can do an addition. So the intermediate, the benzyne intermediate, would look like would look like this. Is it? Would it? We get a different intermediate if we made the pi bond through the pi bonds the other way. That is a different intermediate. We'll see if we wind up with a different product when we do the additions there. So for both of these, we need to add our NH2 to, to each side of the pi bond. So for the blue one, if we added, we're gonna get the same product either way, right? We're gonna get the product We could add to the top carbon or to the other carbon. In both cases, you wind up with one methyl group meta and one methyl group para to our new amide. Right, those are the same molecule, right? Both of the ones drawn in blue. If you take the one that I drew first and you flip it like a pancake, you get the second molecule. But it's, when you have something die substituted like this, it's not always obvious. So it's usually helpful to draw both possibilities and then decide if one of them is the same as the other. Then for the red, we could make one of the same products. So now we have three pathways that give us the same product. Because all three of these are identical, right? In the last case, puts the nitrogen adjacent to one of the methyls. So our two possible products here are adding our amine group para to one methyl and meta to the other methyl. And those all give us the same, those are all the same molecule. And our last case is you could put the, the amine adjacent to one of the methyls which make it meta to the other methyl. Adam? So this might be a little bit of a, too much of a splitting hairs question, but I was curious, is this all happening within the same, like, um, like do you, you don't have to isolate anything. So since we're using the, the sodium amide, like does it, you don't have to get everything to completely go through the elimination and then add more sodium amide, do you? Or does it start, like at what point do, does it start becoming a nucleophile versus the base? So you're going to regenerate the, the nucleophile as your last step here. Because when you go through the addition process, the, amine, the uh, ammonia that you made when amide act as, as the base is then going to give up its hydrogen again to the, to the other side of the pi bond. So you made NH to H you're gonna wind up with, with your amide attaching to one end of the pi bond, that, but then the extra electrons are gonna grab 
that hydrogen there and then you wind up making the amide back again. So all of this is happening simultaneously. Right, and, and you don't even need a two to one stoichiometric ratio because the first step The first step of that proton transfer. So in this case, we're using hydroxide as our base. And so we wind up our last step of the reaction is the conjugate acid of the base from the first step gives that hydrogen up again. Because we wound up going through this substitution process and then we still have an extra pair of electrons at the end. So we wind up remaking that same hydroxide that we started from at the beginning. All right, so this is all happening at the same time. You don't need two equivalents of your base. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the benzyne does not exist for very long is because the, the same substituents that make the benzyne will also react with the benzyne. Um, so if you wanted to go through one of these stranger reactions, like having benzyne react as a, as a dienophile, you need the furan to be present already. Um, and you really, you're going to get a weird mixture of products, but some of them will be this, this cycloadduct. So good, good question. It's presented as though it's separate steps, but it really all of it's happening at the same time because the second you make benzene, you're going to wind up using, you know, reacting with the other amount of base. Um, it will very slow down a lot towards the end because you're if you have a, a really strict one-to-one -one ratio, you actually need two hydroxides for the reaction to happen, but you're only using up one of the hydroxides. So as this reaction happens, it'll slow down a lot as you start running out of a hydroxide um, because you, you need both of them at the same time for this to happen. So you really would probably want to have extra base around, um, but it doesn't need to be a two to one ratio. All right, here's another maybe easier synthesis question. If we want to make methoxybenzene, common name anisole, how do we start from benzene to make anisole? If we we're doing a synthesis question before we got into aromatic rings, if we were doing a synthesis reaction and we had no functional groups attached to an alkane, what's the, the only reaction that you have to start with in that case? First thing you do if all you have an al is an alkane is you brominate it, right? It has to go free radical react mechanism in that case. <laughs> Excuse me. But we'll find that it's also usually a pretty good approach for your first step. Unless you have one of our electrophilic substitutions that can take you directly to the product that you want, a good first step is usually going to be bromination. And then you can go through either elimination addition or you can go through that um, uh, nucleophilic aromatic substitution. But if you get a good leaving group on your benzene ring, we can turn that into whatever we want it to be, right? So if we start from benzene, expose it to bromine and iron. You could do chlorine and aluminum chloride, but chlorine's not as good a leaving group as bromine. So you might as well do, use bromine because you'll get better yields. And that'll give us bromobenzene. 
then we just need a strong base, right? A strong base that can go through one of these sub nucleophilic substitution pathways. And in this case, because we're trying to make something that um, is only mono substituted, we don't really care which pathway it goes through. We just need one of those nucleophilic pathways. So if we expose it to sodium methoxide and heat, and then we really should put that in the same We need to follow it up with a little acid to use up any leftover base and to make sure we, not, we don't have a protonated ether. And wind up with our anisole. So you don't need to draw the benzyne intermediate. It's an intermediate, not an actual product along this pathway. Um, however, if there are multiple options for what your next step could be, a lot of times it's helpful to draw your benzyne intermediates just to make sure you draw all the possible molecules like we did for, for 33 there. And so like, like with a lot of the reactions that we've done, a lot of the synthesis problems we've done before, the trick is not necessarily in converting one functional group to another. A lot of times the trickiest part is getting all of the functional groups where you want them before you then convert, say, a good leaving group to something else. And in this case, we're just trying to make a single substituted benzene. That's pretty easy because all the carbons are equivalent. All right, how are we doing out there? It's, we've added two new mechanisms, a lot of review though. Here's our recap. And just because before we go any further as far as picking the mechanisms, I want to make sure I I, this must not be the last lecture here of, uh, let me double check and see what we're, what we're supposed to cover on Thursday. Because I want to make sure we get to, yeah, we need to make sure we get to add to a few other reactions um, that are essentially ways of converting um, various substituted substituents on benzene into other substituents. Some of them we've seen before. Um, and so basically the ones I'm, I'm talking about are the, the ones drawn in blue here at the bottom. Um, so these reactions, we're not gonna go through the mechanisms for them. Some of the mechanisms um, we actually know, for instance, if we wanted to add a bunch of um, bromines to our carbon, which might be helpful if we wanted to go through that nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Um, if you can start by adding a methyl group, and then if you just expose the excess n bromo succinamide, which is our, that was our reagent that brominated alkanes preferentially in the benzylic position or the allylic position that allowed us to convert from a methyl group into a tribromo group. Um, the other the other one that winds up wind up seeing a lot is wrong button. Um, we can convert a nitro group to an amine. So we don't need to actually go through and use amide as a nucleophile necessarily. If you can add a nitro group where you want it, all we have to then expose it to a reducing agent, like 
a, and a pretty mild reducing agent at that. You just have to expose it to iron or zinc in an acidic environment, and you can convert a nitro group to an amino group. So that winds up being a pretty useful reaction in terms of synthesis because that allows us to, you can add a nitro group to a benzene ring, use it as a meta director, and then convert the nitro group into an amine. Uh, if you just made it an amine first, or if you added a bromine and then had it go through elimination addition, then you would only be able to use it as an ortho para director. So it allows us to convert a meta director into an ortho, sorry, it allows us to convert, yeah, and a meta director into an ortho para director, which gets around some of the um, restrictions of the stereochemistry. It allows us to control where we're putting things when we do these reactions. Um, and same, we, we have the opposite happening with this reaction over on the right. We're taking an ortho para director and turning it into a meta director. If we start with an alkyl group, we can turn it into benzoic acid if we go through that um, oxidation re that we've seen before. You take a benzylic carbon that has a hydrogen and expose it to permanganate, you can convert it to carboxylic acid. Um, and then lastly, there's one more reduction reaction that you can do. If you have zinc or mercury um, in an acidic environment with heat, you can convert this acetyl group or this acyl group and convert it into an alkyl group. So you don't actually need to do the Friel Crafts alkylation, which where we had to worry about um, carbocation rearrangements, et cetera. Um, so the Friel Crafts alkylation, which is this reaction here where you have an, a um, halo alkane with a Lewis acid. That didn't give us great yields. And if it was a larger alkane, we wound up making something that could go through a carbocation rearrangement. So we got a whole bunch of different possible reactants. This mechanism, the acylation, gives us better yields, no risk of rearrangement. And then you can take it and reduce it and remove the oxygen using this last reaction. So we're not going to go through these mechanisms. Um, but they're definitely useful reactions in terms of synthesis um, as a way to, once we get everything where we want it on the benzene ring, we can convert into different functional groups. Right, so picking the order of our reactions of our electrophilic substitutions and then following it up by converting the functional groups is a really useful technique. All right, so quick recap. Here were our three mechanisms. We had electrophilic aromatic substitution where we needed to make an electrophile, usually with a Lewis acid, but we had about six versions of that reaction, right? We could add a nitro group, we could add a halogen, we could add a um, sulfonate group, we could add an acyl group, we can add an alkyl group. That was all of these top reactions. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those were our six electrophilic substitution reactions. From there, we had a couple, it is sulfonation. Um, we had two nucleophilic substitutions that could happen. You could have nucleophilic aromatic substitution, which is the one that had those three very specific criteria. You needed an, a nitro group. The nitro group had to be, and you needed a good leaving group, usually a halide, and they had to be ortho or para relative to each other. If you didn't meet all three of those criteria, this middle one was out. But it was a way to replace a halogen very specifically 
um, and very specific stereochemistry with any good nucleophile. And then our last reaction was the elimination addition. And that one was not as stereospecific because we made that benzyne intermediate. And that benzyne intermediate has two different sides of the alkyne bond, bond, which means you could wind up with potentially two different stereoisomers. So how do we know which of these to expect if we have benzene reacting? Well, the biggest difference is, do we have an electrophile or do we have a nucleophile? If we have an electrophile, then it can't go through either of those others. Those, the second two both depended on having a nucleophile present. If you don't have a nucleophile present, then you can't go through either of the new reactions we added today. So recognizing whether your reactant is a nucleophile or an electrophile makes a big difference here, right? If it's nucleophile, then we basically look at those three criteria for the, for the nucleophilic aromatic substitution. If it has all three of those criteria, nitro group, good leaving group, ortho para to each other, if it has all three of those, you go through that SNAR, that aromatic nucleophilic substitution. If it doesn't, you get elimination addition. Right, so like I mentioned before, this is, this is, less of a situation where we have competing mechanisms because we have the difference between electrophile and a nucleophile as a reactant is very clear cut. Maybe it's, it takes a little practice to be able to see it, but it's night and day as far as what type of reactions they're going to go through. Um, and once they're nucleophilic, if they don't meet all three criteria, it's 100% elimination addition. And if it does meet all three criteria, forget about elimination addition. And it's only going to go through that SNAR. Right? So it's less about competing mechanisms in this case and finding out small clues and more about following this flow chart. And again, the biggest difference is electrophilic versus nucleophilic. Right. Anything that's missing electrons or has um, a Lewis acid involved is going to be an electrophile. Anything with a negative charge or that's a strong base is going to be a nucleophile. So we're not going to have time to draw all three of these mechanisms, but we can decide which mechanism they will go through, and you can draw the mechanism yourself for practice. But let's try to use some of that logic to decide which of these, which mechanism we're going to go through for each of these reactions. What was the first the first question on the flow chart. Nucleophile or electrophile? Yeah, nucleophile versus electrophile. If we could say electrophilic, that answered the question we were done, right? We didn't have to worry about the second question. So out of these, A, that's a nucleophile. B, that's a nucleophile. They have negative charges, right? They're strong bases. B, we don't have a strong base. And in fact, we have a Lewis acid. So that's going to be an electrophilic aromatic substitution. And remember, all the electrophilic aromatic substitutions 
you were going to replace a hydrogen with whatever your electrophile is. And you're going to kick a hydrogen off as a, as a proton, basically, as an H+. plus. Because if it's electrophilic, we don't have enough electrons to go around, and hydrogen is the least electronegative. So hydrogen is always going to be what gets kicked off as an H+. Plus. If it's nucleophilic, we're not going to kick an H plus off because we have, we have plenty of electrons. If it's nucleophilic, we're going to kick off something that's going to take its electrons with it. So in this case, for A, we've got a nucleophilic um, reactant. We don't have a nitro group though. We don't have a strong, we don't have a good leaving group and also a strong electron withdrawing group. So this mechanism is going to go through the elimination addition or that benzyne intermediate. In this bottom one, we've got a nucleophile, we've got a good leaving group in the iodine, we have a strong electron withdrawing group in the nitro group, and they're para relative to each other. So we get our nucleophilic aromatic substitution. All right, again, these are the three mechanisms that you're supposed to be able to draw from this chapter. Those last, those other reactions to convert between the various functional groups, you don't have to be able to draw the mechanisms for those. You have to know that they exist when it comes to synthesis reactions. On the open book test, I would hope that you'd be able to find them in the, re in the reaction review and answer any reactions they don't have a mechanism that I'm gonna ask you to draw. These are the three most important mechanisms that we added for this chapter. Elimination addition, SNAR, and electrophilic aromatic substitution. All right. There's a few more practice problems here, but we're not going to go over them now. We can we will cover these at the beginning of class on Thursday to review how this would work. Um, and these involve some of those other functional group conversions as well. So we'll end here. Everybody come to lab today. And we'll start talking about how we can use some of those geometries from last week's lab and actually run some calculations on them. Um, and so make sure you come and I will make sure to record as well and we'll post that lab video. Um, thanks to those of you who reminded me that I'd forgotten to post Thursday's lecture. Um, I just didn't get to it before I had to step away from my computer on Thursday. And so I forgot about it. So. Um, if that held up you getting your quiz turned in on time, don't stress about that. You know, I'm generous, especially when it's my screw up that made you late. Um, and everybody have yourselves a great morning and I'll see you at one.